Tonight, China's power on the rise across the globe. Its secret policy revealed reaching inside Canada. If you do not come back, your family member's life would be at risk. China in the spotlight. New documents uncovered, a grand economic plan explained. If someone is telling me this will work, I'm going to do it. They're sold as hope to desperate people, but do fertility supplements work? They deal with that every day, so they're afraid. A call for help from families, a Saskatchewan First Nation in crisis. And Winnipeg welcomes home its Grey Cup heroes. A cause for celebration, three decades in the making. This is The National. Around the world tonight, condemnation after the secrecy of China's imprisonment of Muslim minorities was blown wide open. Beijing's blueprint to round up, incarcerate and indoctrinate at least a million Muslims, most of them ethnic Uyghurs. Tonight, we look at the reach of those ambitions. The scale is plain in the China cable. Secret government documents uncovered by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists in partnership with the CBC and other news outlets. Mass arrests in China's Xinjiang province, prison camps, layers of surveillance and control with the goal of so-called ideological transformation. For the 2,000 members of the Uyghur minority living here in Canada, the details are chilling but not surprising. Many are feeling China's grip even here. He's far from China but not beyond its reach a young Uyghur too afraid to reveal his identity. Because Chinese government can track you uh, everywhere. His is a story of pressure, and he shows us documents he was pushed to send to China. His Canadian address, copies of his ID, and something extraordinary. And they even got my blood type and DNA. So how'd this happen? Back home in China, his parents had been approached by police, curious about where he was. The implied threat? get the information or they might end up in the detention camps. But they, he tells us authorities already had seized his parents' passports so they can't leave China. For him to go back might mean yeah. detention. How, how will you see your parents again? I can't, I can't see them in, in other countries. Not just one man's worries, surveilling, separating families seems part of China's plan. The leaked documents outline how people are to be tracked or refused approval for visas. Some who've left the country arrested the moment they cross the border back. The bulletins note watching people with dual citizenship and point out five are Canadian. Yes, she spoke to me before. After 20 years in Canada, Uyghur activist Rukia Turdish is less afraid for herself, but worries deeply about the Uyghur students here who reach out to her for help. Her phone seems a lifeline for them. Some of them, even the mothers and fathers, force them, okay, so the police bothering me so much, send the like, power of attorney, write down the letter with the lawyer, just that you're not my son anymore or you're not my daughter anymore. Beyond the heartbreak of having to disown their parents, some are pressured to return to China, frightened their families will be punished if they don't. Some students just disappear from Canada. Hard to know how many have gone. At least six, seven of them told me. The rest of them didn't tell me because they so scared. You see the face? Her burden is to listen and be haunted by things she cannot change. That's Canadian Mehmet Takti's trauma too, and it's personal. This is his mom back in Xinjiang. He last spoke with her in October of 2016 and says it felt like goodbye. She told me, if we are not able to meet this world probably hereafter, and do not think too much about us and continue to do what is right for you and take care of yourself. His fight for justice has felt lonely, but now the proof is out. He wonders what the world will do. This is the largest, largest abuse of state power since Second World War. If we do not issue a condemnation on this, so what else we will issue this condemnation? So how is the world reacting now that the documents make clear what's happening? Katie Nicholson looks at the response. The human rights violations exposed here in Xinjiang can't be ignored, says Washington. They say it's sovereign. It's in our country, therefore you shouldn't be meddling in our internal affairs. Yeah, but that argument doesn't work when human rights are involved and human, human lives are, are being impacted. 
Global Affairs Canada says it too is deeply concerned. We continue to call on the Chinese government to ensure the human rights of its people, including freedom of religion, are fully respected. Official statements aren't concrete action. Fight for religious freedom. But Anastasia Lin, a former Canadian beauty queen, once banned from China for her views on religious freedom, says those words can be powerful to those whose rights are being trampled. When Western officials speak up, for them it's really that little bit of hope that helped them hanging there just a little bit longer. Because without the Western voice, these people have absolutely no weapon to defend themselves inside China. A former Canadian ambassador to China thinks Ottawa can do more than issue a statement. Another measure that we, have, we, we should consider taking is making sure that no Canadian equipment uh, is uh, sent to uh, China that could be used uh, for uh, crowd control or used to uh, limit uh, freedom of speech. It's a game changer. The Uyghur Human Rights Project in Washington believes the abuses laid bare in the documents will prompt more than government action. I expect a rash of company decisions to stop sourcing there and to stop operating there. I certainly expect that it will be very hard for UN bodies to avoid upholding the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which requires uh, states to act uh, on gross human rights violations. For its part, China says this is an internal matter, and the stability, ethnic solidarity, and harmony in Xinjiang is the best response to such disinformation. So Katie, as you said, there are statements now, but I think a lot of people are wondering, what about action? Okay, so not necessarily action, but a call to action. The UK Foreign Office now calling upon China to open its borders to uh, UN monitors uh, to come in to the camps and actually have unfettered access, see for themselves what's happening there. And uh, Guy Saint-Jacques, the former uh, Canadian ambassador to China, saying yes, that is something Canada should also throw its weight behind. Okay, we'll watch to see what happens. Katie Nicholson, thanks very much. You're welcome. And in an entirely different case of detention in China, two Canadians, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, have been held there for nearly a year now. Global Affairs says the most recent consular visits for Kovrig and Spavor were last week, but there's been no apparent progress in getting them released. They were arrested in China just days after the RCMP arrested Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou to face charges in the U.S. In May, the two Canadians were charged with spying offenses. And stay with us tonight as we launch our new special series on China's power. We will look at the man driving a quest for global dominance and how he's doing it. <laughs> Sasha Petrosik examines the myth and the mission of Xi Jinping. That's coming up. And then there's Hong Kong. The Chinese government may need to reconsider how it handles the region going forward after a record voter turnout with a near sweep for pro-democracy candidates. Greg Rasmussen is there. We have five demands. Some of the winners in Sunday's vote went straight to the scene of one of the city's most heated battles. A university where some pro-democracy protesters fearing arrest remain barricaded inside. We should show uh, our unity to save our students, uh, save our university campus. After months of turmoil, most of Hong Kong has been calm since the election. The pro-democracy civic party saw many of its candidates swept in as part of a wave energized by young voters. Beijing should listen to Hong Kong people. We have spoken loud and clear. Accountability for police misconduct and universal suffrage for higher levels of government are two key demands. He says despite months of rioting and unrest, the vote made it clear most citizens back the protest movement rather than the pro-Beijing establishment. They have all the resources, they have been here for so long, they have the machi machinery, they have the big data, and they still fail. Before Sunday's vote, 70 percent of the seats were held by parties sympathetic to Beijing. It shows a kind of very clear support uh, for democracy by the Hong Kong people. He says the city's higher level of government, the Legislative Council, tried to pretend it had the support of the silent majority. And then they dismissed public opinion polls, they dismissed demonstrations, and then, but this is a kind of a, a very unambiguous message uh, sent to them by the voting population. Hong Kong's Beijing-backed leader, Kerry 
Mary Lamb says she would listen humbly and seriously reflect on these lower level elections. Including deficiencies in governance, including unhappiness with the um, time taken to deal with the current unstable environment. Some of the newly powerful pro-democracy parties responded with a fresh call for Lamb's resignation. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Hong Kong. Now to Washington and the latest firing of a top U.S. official. Navy Secretary Richard Spencer was pushed out yesterday after Donald Trump objected to the treatment of a Navy SEAL facing military justice. Susan Ormston shows us the unlikely way it all played out. It was Animal House at the White House today. First, Cash and Ben, the draft horses, delivering this year's Christmas tree. And then, with questions swirling around another high-level firing, President Trump emerged with Conan, the dog. We just gave Conan a, a medal and a plaque. And it, it's really, uh, and I actually think Conan knew exactly what was going on. A brave dog, he said, who chased al-Baghdadi up a Syrian tunnel, was almost fatally injured and survived. Unlike Trump's Navy Secretary, Richard Spencer, who was forced out on Sunday after the president objected to the way a Navy SEAL was treated. Eddie Gallagher was acquitted of murder in the death of a 12-year-old ISIS fighter, but he was demoted for taking a trophy picture of himself in front of the corpse. The Navy was considering expelling Gallagher from the elite unit, stripping him of his prestigious Trident pin. Trump wasn't about to let that happen. With Eddie Gallagher, you know that story very well. They wanted to take his pin away, and I said, no, you're not going to take it away. Enter the defense secretary, Mark Esper. The case of Eddie Gallagher has dragged on for months and is distracting too many. It must end. Following the president's order, the Navy SEAL keeps his rank while the secretary of the Navy is fired. Spencer blistered the president in an outgoing letter. I no longer share the same understanding with the commander in chief in regards to the key principle of good order and discipline. What message does that send to the troops that you can get away with things? President Trump has a record number of cabinet departures in a first term. That's 10. Technically, the Navy secretary is not in cabinet, but his leaving raises fresh questions about Trump's relationship with senior members of the military and his personal interference in military justice. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. In northern Saskatchewan today, the funeral of a 10-year-old girl lent urgency to a small community's cry for help in the face of what it calls a suicide crisis. In just six months, four people have taken their lives, one child, two teens, and a man in his 40s. Over the weekend, five more young people made the attempt and were taken to hospital. Seven lives have been lost to suicide since 2016 in an isolated First Nation that is home to about a thousand people. And that is where Bonnie Allen begins a story that's now being heard across the province. A sacred fire burned all weekend on Makwasagagan First Nation to honor 10-year-old Jalen Angus. She loved music and dancing. She was buried today after taking her own life. This is, uh, it's just unthinkable. Jalen's aunt is a mental health therapist. Help these children. We can't help the ones that have already passed on, but help these ones that are, that are, are seeking help. Jalen's friend, a 14-year-old girl, took her own life earlier this month. And in the summer, band counselor Tommy Little Spruce lost his 16-year-old granddaughter Maggie Ben to suicide. He says her home life was troubled and she was in and out of the child welfare system. They have to deal with drug abuse, alcoholism in their community, sexual abuse, domestic abuse, physical bullying. They deal with that every day. So they're afraid. Little Spruce wants family counseling and parenting courses. To heal the community, heal the homes, and it'll have a ripple effect to the youth who are suffering right now. James Kaidohat is taking his son hunting. Ten-year-old Devron went to school with the young girl who died. I got him close to me every day. From now on. Both the federal and provincial governments have pledged more resources, but the provincial opposition is calling for a suicide prevention strategy. Families are hurting, they're looking for answers, and they're hearing nothing 
from this government. We're going to continue to work forward in, in looking at the, the uh, gaps that may be out there in services being offered, Mr. Speaker. The band leadership says crisis counselors will assess all school-aged children for suicide risk in the days ahead. But they're asking for long-term funding to hire full-time therapists, ones who would provide suicide intervention training and family counselling for months, even years. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. A federal court has approved one of the largest financial settlements in Canadian history. It means the government will pay an estimated $900 million dollars to Canadian Forces members and Defence Department employees who suffered sexual assault or misconduct. Individual payments will range from $5,000 to $155,000, depending on the circumstances. A lawyer for one of the victims called it a historic victory that holds a powerful institution to account. Well, hundreds of fans decked out in blue and gold gathered at the Winnipeg airport today to welcome home the Blue Bombers. The players hoisted the Grey Cup to roaring cheers, then struggled to keep it together. Cameron McIntosh was there. A day later, it's still sinking in, especially for the most ardent fans. Aaron Chernichan pulled his daughters from school just to be part of it. I was uh, almost her age the last time the Bombers won the Grey Cup, and there's those moments here that you just got to cherish and take in. You never know when the next one's going to be. How long have you been waiting for this? Um, <laughs> a long, long time. 29 years, that's a lot of time to build up anticipation. There's also been plenty of disappointment along the way for Bomber fans. For many of these people, the wait has been so long, this is actually a once-in-a-lifetime event. The former tie get Justin Medlock to kick it off. So pretty high emotional stakes then, watching the team take the field. But the Bombers scored first. Touchdown! Never looked back and won convincingly. The Blue Bombers, 2019 Great Cup champions. From the celebration on the field to Portage in Maine, which hasn't seen this since 1990. It's the strength of Winnipeg. We're, we're, tough, we're tough people. All of it building up to this. The Grey Cup touching down in Winnipeg in Bomber hands even if there was a little mishap. It's just a little you know, wear and tear, you know. You gotta get some screws tightened. I'm pretty sure that's happened before, though. I'm pretty sure. This isn't the first time. Who says Winnipeg can't have nice things? Team president Wade Miller lived through the drought as a player. I believe this uh, team is important for the province and the city, and, uh, you know, it's a fabric of our community. Oh, Chantal and Connor Grenko just hope it's not 29 years until the next one. These guys don't really understand how, how long we've hoped for this. Victory is fleeting. Savor it. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And some more good news. Tonight's moment is also inspired by the Blue Bombers and the man now known for finally putting on a pair of pants. <laughs> but first, concerns over supplements that promise to help women get pregnant. Trouble is, they're unproven. And later, why Vancouver's golf courses could help solve a housing crisis. A U.S. consumer watchdog is calling for a crackdown on fertility supplements for women. Some are sold online, some at retailers, some are Canadian. But as Vicodopia tells us, they all have one thing in common. According to the experts, there's no scientific evidence they'll actually help you get pregnant. Before her hands were full with three little children, Carolyn Dubé's heart was heavy. She couldn't get pregnant. It's incredibly emotional and, um, you know, there's a process of grieving and anger and frustration. The couple spent more than $10,000 on successful in vitro fertilization, but also hundreds of dollars more on fertility supplements, usually a mixture containing vitamins and herbal extracts. You feel like you're grasping at straws and you feel like, okay, if someone is telling me this will work, I'm going to do it because I need to uh, make sure that I have covered every avenue I can in order to make sure that um, I can build this family that I want so desperately. It's that desperation that these companies are exploiting. 
The Center for Science and the Public Interest is a U.S. consumer watchdog. It successfully pushed the Food and Drug Administration to crack down on supplements sold as aids for opioid withdrawal. Now the group wants the FDA to go after makers of natural fertility supplements for women. If they provided a study at all, we looked them up. Uh, we looked elsewhere on, you know, in the medical literature to find evidence that particular ingredients work. But in the end, we came up empty. There's just no evidence that any of these 39 products uh, has the kind of evidence for effectiveness that you would want. Two of those supplements are Canadian, Fertilify and Fertile Pro. They're licensed by Health Canada, but not for fertility, though that's what the companies promote in their online marketing. Neither company would do a recorded interview. Still, there are dozens more licensed supplements with names such as Fertimax and Fertilaid sold in Canadian pharmacies and clinics run by fertility doctors. I think this is your follow-up at one of Canada's largest clinics in Toronto, they do sell male fertility supplements, which this doctor says is supported by limited evidence that they can help in sperm health. But he says female fertility supplements are another story. That's false advertising to some degree. I think they have to, it's very important that Health Canada look at this and say, are these people really uh, what they claim? Is, it, is there any real evidence for it? Health Canada stands by its licensing of natural health products, though it says it will investigate claims being made by makers of fertility supplements. The agency is also proposing tighter licensing rules, which would require scientific evidence, much like prescription drugs. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, among the other stories we are following tonight, less than a week after being named Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, Krista Freeland was in Alberta meeting with one of Justin Trudeau's most outspoken critics. Certainly our government heard from Alberta a strong message in the election and that means we have to listen really hard. Freeland met with Alberta Premier Jason Kenney as Ottawa works to address regional tensions highlighted in last month's election. Kenney has often criticized the federal government but he expressed a desire for a productive meeting today and played up Freeland's Alberta roots, saying she understands the entire country. Meanwhile, frustrated Quebec farmers looking for government action on that CN rail strike, they took their message directly to the Prime Minister. A convoy of tractors drove to Montreal today, delivering a giant pile of corn to Justin Trudeau's constituency office. They say the strike has disrupted their supply of propane, which they use as fuel to dry their crops. Canada's largest potash mine also announced a temporary shutdown, resulting in more than 500 layoffs in Saskatchewan. Up next on The National, a closer look at China's growing influence in the world, its plan to top the world's economy and the man behind it all. We begin our special series, China's Power, right after the break. Welcome back. After decades of American dominance, Beijing now rivals Washington for global leadership, with potential consequences for just about everyone. Tonight, we launch our special series on China's power, examining the threats and the opportunities ahead in what some already call China's century. Financially, militarily, technologically, its power grows by the day. And by extension, so does uncertainty about the existing world order. If Americans now question their country's role in the world, inside China, there's no such hand-wringing. It sees its rise as a simple return to a natural order, the world a great wheel with China at the center. 500 years of Western dominance, merely a passing chapter in history. Not everyone may see it that way. We are the piggy bank to the world. We've been ripped off by China. But what is clear is that China's force cannot be denied, and the world will just have to adjust. Over the next week, we will look at China's power in politics, trade, and culture. We begin tonight with Sasha Petrosik's look at the man driving its aggressive push forward. They come by the busload. Hundreds of political pilgrims tracing the steps of Chinese President Xi Jinping daily into the rugged hills of northeast China. Dusty yellow soil where the seeds of his cult of personality now grow. 
where party officials obediently line up to hear legends of how she once waded barefoot into freezing water to help the villagers clear ice dams. She was banished here as a teen 50 years ago from a family with a solid communist pedigree caught in the purges of Mao Zedong's cultural revolution. Living in this cave, learning, as the slogan says, to struggle hard and be self-reliant. Today, the required political lectures continue around the village, as were followed by police and kept from interviewing anyone. Such is the sensitivity to Xi's image. To believe in this flag is to believe in President Xi, says Liu Mingfu. He lectured political thought at China's military college. As soon as he came to power, she promoted the Chinese dream, he says, the great rejuvenation of our nation. Indeed, as the most powerful man in China, chairman of the party and a president who did away with term limits so he could rule for life, she has made nationalism his rallying cry. We will safeguard our sovereignty, he told the People's Congress. Any tricks to split China are doomed. Xi has built a Chinese military force unlike anything the world has seen here. His key aim is to reintegrate lost territories like Hong Kong and Taiwan, possibly by force, and to become the world's leading economic power, challenging the U.S. in every way. To lay the groundwork, she has consolidated power at home with a growing personal presence and a tough dictatorial rule, reining in any possible dissent from Muslim Uyghurs by jailing more than a million, shutting down churches and locking up human rights activists, cracking down on opposing voices in the Communist Party. Still, there are some who challenge his vision. Zhang Lifan is a historian. <laughs> China's one-party dictatorship is very difficult to sustain, says the former member of the respected Academy of Social Sciences, who's among few here not afraid to speak out. Okay. She is full of fantasies, Zhang says. He lives in the illusion of building a great world empire and replacing the U.S., but it's too huge and unrealistic. Not so, say the country's leaders, who point to China's rise, which has been as dramatic as she's owned from those days in the village. And yet, the permanence of all this prosperity is not guaranteed. China's economy is slowing, its military is largely untested, and this rise to great power status is facing growing resistance internationally. Sasha Petrosek, CBC News, Beijing. To get a better sense of the impact of China's ambitious economic plans, just look to the Caribbean. Yes. And this is where the Jamaican government agreed to allow the Chinese to build a huge port. David Common takes us to Jamaica for the controversy and the cost. China's power continues in two months. More now in our series on China's power and a look at how Beijing plans to redraw global trade. In 2013, Xi Jinping announced a multinational infrastructure project that's both state-of-the-art and massive, dwarfing the Marshall Plan to rebuild post-war Europe. His inspiration, thousands of years old. Stretching thousands of kilometers from China to the Roman Empire, the ancient Silk Road carried goods, ideas, philosophies, and technologies, enriching each civilization along the way. The Belt and Road Initiative aims to resurrect and expand that lucrative corridor on a colossal scale with two branches. The Belt links China over land with Europe through Central Asia and the Middle East, while the Road refers to sea routes connecting China to East Africa and the Mediterranean, creating a gigantic trade zone encompassing three continents and more than 60 percent of the world's population, in effect cementing China as the world's next superpower. But ambition of this scale requires a staggering amount of infrastructure, and so China is already building. 
highways, rail terminals, bridges and seaports in countries throughout the massive region. By 2049, the target date for completion, China's total investment will be in the trillions of dollars. So obviously Beijing is thinking big, but it's not stopping at the Eurasian landmass. It wants to take its new Silk Road to every corner of the earth, including America's backyard. David Common now on what's already happening in the Caribbean. Step onto a Jamaican construction site and you might wonder, what's with all the Chinese workers? These boots on the ground, part of China's foray into the Caribbean. Bringing with it Chinese loans, but also friction. These are the beginnings of a much needed children's hospital, a gift from China, but one with strings attached. It's their contractor, up to 50% their workers, leaving many in the local industry cut out. At sites across Jamaica, it's often like that, except it's usually alone, a big one. So they're doing a number of buildings looking very similar to that one. And that has engineer Carvel Stewart speaking out. You're saying China essentially loaned money to itself to do work in well, another country? Well, well, that's what it did because it, it lends you the money and on the bottom of it, it says the beneficiary is China Harbor Engineering Company. The people who build the roads the and do the projects. The people build the roads and do the project. While the infrastructure is needed, the added debt, he says, is not, especially if China's investment doesn't improve the economy in the long run. We will be seeking funds to repay those loans later on without having had the opportunity for the economy to earn from those funds. To understand who wins and who loses, we're hitting the road. Jamaica borrowed $700 million to have a Chinese state-owned firm build this toll highway. A thousand Chinese were imported to do the work alongside Jamaicans. It's also the first pillar we see of China's strategic plan, an outlet for their labor. And it's hard for Jamaica to say no to China. A country full of dilapidated roads and a government too broke to fix them all. So locals hustle to collect money to pay for cement and do the work themselves. Important to, do it. to put it in perspective, we're heading to meet one of Jamaica's most senior statesmen. Hi, Ambassador. Morning. How are you? Very good. Thank Pleasure. you very much. Very good to meet you. We'll get you right Richard here. Bernal was Jamaica's ambassador to Washington, now Thanks runs so a global uh, center at its main university. I know there are cases in other developing countries where they bring in a lot of their own workers. But in this case, the numbers are relatively small and they have been reducing over time. He dismisses concerns over who's doing the work when you consider what Jamaica is getting with the loans. One, the terms are quite generous, long repayment periods, low interest. Secondly, the Chinese are very competitive in carrying out these construction projects. And thirdly, what you find is that it comes with less conditionality than Western aid. But in return for its money, China is looking for influence and opportunity. And that is all about location. So this is Little Goat Island? Yes, it is. Goat Island sits directly north of the strategically critical Panama Canal. Yes. And this is where the Jamaican government agreed to allow the Chinese to build a huge port. This is where they want to build a port. But when Ingrid Parchment heard about it, she knew it had to be stopped. I thought, why are we giving away one of our major resources to somebody because they have an idea? Why aren't we protecting for us what we need? She leads a group responsible for coastal conservation. What was it that concerned you in particular? I think the idea that they were going to be leveling the island, removing all of the trees, which is habitat for birds, and also the mangroves in particular, which are where the baby fish and crabs grow. We'd also have been doing a lot of dredging and the dredging would mean that all of the seagrass, all of that lovely starfish you saw coming, etc., all of that would be lost as well. But not everyone had a problem. I think there were mixed responses. Persons thought there's an opportunity for employment. Others thought maybe they would be using their boats to carry material back and forth. Jamaica struggles with that mix, and few places 
better illustrate that than here, the Alpart Mine. Another pillar for China is access to the Caribbean's resources. This mine lay dormant for years, but China needs aluminum, and the bauxite they process here is a key ingredient. When Chinese conglomerate JISCO bought it, they got that access, and the community got jobs. Do you know anybody who worked at the mine? My aunt is a chef. We depend on the mine. That's what we depend on. We don't have no other else source inside the plant. But the mine's reopening also brought problems. Last month, it shut down for an upgrade, pushing many back out to unemployment. But not before Jamaica's environmental regulator issued 16 enforcement orders against JISCO. The source of the problem? This vast residue disposal area. It was blamed for causing serious environmental and human health issues in the neighboring community. Actually, a mile from the mud lake, and it's really disturbing me. Are you worried for the kids like this? Of course, 100% worried. When the dust blow, um, sometimes it's rush up our skin and all of that. These are legitimate concerns, but they aren't new ones, says Ambassador Bernal. I'm not saying they haven't broken some laws, but guess what? The residue from bauxite plants have been here since they were established 50 years ago by Canadians and American firms. So if Jamaicans are concerned, he argues, they should take it up with their own government. Which is what Ingrid's group did. They pushed back against the government and won. Plans for the port on Goat Island? Cancelled. One of the things we were fearful of is that if you allowed for this, then what next? China did ultimately build Caribbean ports, just not in Jamaica. I think the big thing is trade. China analyst Scott McDonald is writing a book all about it. He's even got the title, The New Cold War in the Caribbean. Is the U.S. and China definitely have marked out a new competitiveness, a rivalry, if you want, that does look like a Cold War in some aspects. Because this is right in their backyard. This is the this American is, backyard. This allows China to make a poke at the United States in its soft underbelly, if you want. The U.S. has warned Caribbean countries about taking on too much debt from China. Does debt mean that you are much more than just indebted on an economic level, that you are in part owned by China? I wouldn't go to say that you're owned, but perhaps China has a leverage. China has enough sway that Jamaica's prime minister just visited Beijing, but soon after announced a pause in any new borrowing, shifting more towards public and private investment. Jamaicans are now among more than 4 billion people globally touched by China's involvement beyond its own borders. China is playing the long game, and it's getting closer and closer to our own shores. Tomorrow, our series on China's power continues with a look at Huawei's relationship with some of Canada's top universities, the threat and the opportunity. Frankly, the government of Canada has fallen down catastrophically because it's just meant that no one knows exactly what they should be doing. If those counterparties didn't feel that we were a trustworthy actor, they wouldn't do business with us. The controversial tech giant is spending big money in this country, but is it partnership or is it infiltration? That is tomorrow on The National. Meantime, lots more news ahead in two minutes. The high stakes heist caught on camera at one of the world's oldest museums. Details after this. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast from Burner, as parents of children on the autism spectrum find themselves frustrated by mainstream medicine, they're turning to alternative, clinically unproven, and sometimes harmful treatments. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Europe Now, where London has stripped Uber of its license to operate in the city. There have been examples where drivers who've had their license suspended or dismissed have manipulated Uber's system uh, to carry on driving people around and that's taken a real risk with Londoners safety and security. Officials say there were also more than 14,000 rides in which drivers faked their identities but Uber isn't disappearing from London just yet. The company is appealing and can continue to operate during that process until there's a final decision.
A manhunt is underway in Germany following a heist at one of the world's oldest museums. Security camera footage shows two people breaking into the Green Vault Museum, smashing a display case and making off with 18th century jewelry. Police believe there was even a getaway car waiting outside. And what's more, it was completely dark at the time because a nearby fire caused street lights to go out. Investigators do not think that was a coincidence. Museum officials describe the jewelry as priceless. And the U.S. Supreme Court will not review the case of Adnan Syed, whose murder conviction was chronicled in the popular Serial podcast. Syed is serving a life sentence for killing his ex-girlfriend in 1999. He always maintained his innocence. And after the podcast took off, there was support for a new trial. His lawyers argued he didn't have effective counsel at his trial. But in turning down the case, as per usual, the Supreme Court did not give any reasons. Okay, we'll be right back with the debate over Vancouver's golf courses. Could some part of the solution to that city's housing crisis rest on the future of fairways? We'll take a look in two. Housing prices in Metro Vancouver may have fallen in recent months, but they're still out of reach for a lot of people. Last month, the benchmark price for all residential properties was just under a million bucks. A big part of the problem, there aren't a lot of places left to build. So as Tina Lovegreen explains, some experts are eyeing greener pastures. Teeing off all year is a West Coast luxury. And when you can do it in the middle of the city, even better. I just live a block away, so uh, I come down as often as I can. Well, it's so close and then like price-wise, I think it's competitive with other courses. The publicly owned Langara Golf Course's central location is what attracts a lot of players. But that's also what makes it an attractive but controversial place to build housing. Particularly when you see the numbers. This urban designer and a colleague say there is a huge opportunity to take a bite out of the housing crisis in Vancouver by developing spaces like this one. We're just not in, you know, making land anymore, so here's a chance to think about uh, the golf course in a more ethical way. The city owns and operates three public golf courses, adding up to roughly two square kilometers of land. The UBC experts say if developed, it could house 60,000 people and be worth $20 billion. Well, I'm against it because I like, I like golf, so I think it's a great course too, right? So yeah, I'm totally against that. There was a time a few years ago where everything was being converted into a golf course and now it's gone the other way for a while. Okay, so not exactly welcome news for golfers, but the experts argue the sport isn't exactly on the upswing. And turning fairways into driveways is a conversation in other parts of Canada too. A handful of private clubs in Ontario have already been sold off for development. The parkland we have is precious, and if you start developing and paving over, there's no way back. But this Vancouver Park Board Commissioner isn't ready to give up on the Greens. With the situation, with the uh, population increasing in the neighbourhood, that yes, uh, more than just golf will be the answer. But at the very least, the urban designers are asking the city to consider their pitch that building housing here is a good play. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. After the break, an 18-year-old promise was finally mercifully put to an end. When the Blue Bombers won the Grey Cup, we will tell you all about it in our moment. Welcome back. Okay, question. Do you remember this guy? Of course you do. He's the Blue Bombers fan who kept a vow he made 18 years ago. No long pants until the team won the Grey Cup. Well, they hadn't won until yesterday, and Chris Matthew was there. So we caught up with him and his wife when they got home, a little tired, a little overwhelmed, to reflect on the whole crazy experience. And that, of course, is our moment of the day. It's been so long that I, since I put on pants, I almost fell over. The game, fabulous. The outcome, fabulous. Wearing the pants, I'm not so sure yet because it's, it's all new to me now. He knew these would fit and they're comfortable. This is way more than I ever expected in the first place and uh, I don't know how people that are actual true celebrities put up with this stuff all the time. People like to cheer for an, an ordinary person, someone who doesn't really fit the mold. 
Even coming home through the airports and everything, it's just been, yay! <laughs> people know that they're not the only dopey people in the world when they have me as a, as a role model. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we 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 have to give them their own show. Oh, so, sure. <laughs> surely two sure. co-hosts of the national they can, can join us something. If they'd like. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if you if you saw this, but but Darla was wearing a a, a pass at the game that said hashtag Do It for Darla. Uh, she has clearly emerged as the star here, quite yeah. possibly the lucky charm too. Yeah, she's... she was so eager for him to to get you know. Yeah, she's changes. the she's the real champion. I I don't see how he sticks with the pants though. Like, I mean, about 18 years is a long time to go without ever having... Imagine how well, oppressive they would feel. I would suggest oh. he loves his wife, Chris. <laughs> He'll stick with the pants. That is a national for November 25th. Good night. Good night.